this is episode two of the webinar series on the European astronauts selection process organized by our giant leap, which is an initiative of SGAC, the Space Generation Advisory Council. We are very happy to be here today with Owen to host this webinar with our uh, three great speakers. Uh, thank you everyone for connecting from all over the world. It's great to see all of your greetings in the chat. Feel free to keep speaking in the chat. We'll be uh, checking your questions and comments during the webinar. My name is Charlotte Nassi. I will be one of your hosts this evening for the webinar alongside my friend Owen Tui. Hey everyone, my name is Owen Tui, uh, so I'm super happy to be here and super happy to have all, everyone here as well. So as Owen already showed uh, a few minutes ago, we will be using a Slido. So the Slido will allow us to ask you a few questions to make this webinar a bit more interactive. We'd like to know more about you. We'd like to know more about why you're here, what questions you have. So please use your phone to scan this QR code and you will have access to the questions. Our Giant Leap team will also be adding the link to the Slido in the chat. Uh, if you don't have a phone with you right now, you can also just click on the link on your computer and start answering the questions. Wow, you've been much quicker than me. So thank you. Thank you for starting the Slido. Uh, Owen is from Ireland and I am from France and the UK. Um, tell us where you are from, uh, be it your country or your city. Uh, just keep adding. I'm from a little town in Brittany, but currently living in the Netherlands. Owen, oh, where, where are you from in Ireland? Uh, yeah, so obviously I'm from Ireland. I'm from a place called Wicklow, which is just, just below Dublin. If you've ever been, if you haven't been, get there when, when the world's back to normal. It's, it's lovely, but I'm, I'm biased. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we can see people from all over the world. Malaysia, Malaysia India, Spain, Poland, Wales. Austria, our giant leap, good to hear. Northern Ireland, oh, uh, someone now living in Strasbourg. Uh, so both Charlotte and I studied in ISU and, and a lot of our speakers here are also in, involved in ISU, either, either staff or where staff or where attendance. Um, Algeria, Frankfurt. Okay, perfect. And some of Ireland, you. Um, <laughs> okay. We've got uh, the US, Spain, Russia. It's great to see. Thank you so much for joining. So I think we can uh, go on to our next question. Yeah, you can keep adding to the previous questions during the webinar. We will be uh, coming back to them and just checking where your answers are from and just uh, just sharing it with, with the audience. Uh, so just to know a little bit more about you and about why you're here. So as some of you might know, Our Giant Leap is an initiative to encourage diversity in the space sector. And we would really like to know which gender you identify with. Um, our Giant Leap is mostly a team of, uh, started by a, quite a big team of women, but now we are increasingly recruiting uh, more diverse profiles, which is great. So uh, thanks a lot for participating. Keep answering the questions. Uh, just some people are people are asking there in the chat, is this, will this be recorded? Yeah, so, so the webinar is being recorded and it'll, it'll be released at a later date uh, to watch again, uh, just if you are asking. And for those of you who missed episode one of the webinar, Why Do We Need More Women Astronauts? It will soon be available on YouTube in replay. So look out for that as well. Uh, we discussed um, different topics with two great speakers. We had Dr. Mikaela Musilova, who's working in Hawaii on analog uh, missions called High Seas. And we had Professor Virginia Watering from the International Space University, who told us a little bit more about women's health in space, which was super interesting. So look out for episode one of the webinars. Okay, so it's uh, for the for the poll. It's seen that we got a large amount of cisgender females here, and and also males. And um, so it's good good to have a it's it's a it's a nice split there. Quite a good balance. Yeah. So finally, our last questions before we before we kick in. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, oh, has disappeared. Here we go. Uh, so it's <laughs> what sector do you work in? Um, so this is an open question. Just to get an idea. We want to see how many people here are in the space sector, how many are in research or engineering. Um, it's just, just good to give a bit of background. So we can see straight away the majority of people are from space. 
Space, great to see research. Okay, education, engineering. Owen here is also engineering. Engineering and, I and am, Charlotte, uh, Charlotte and law. In space law. law, yeah. Um, good, good. Wow, Some aviation, people in art. a lot of aviation. Medical devices, R and D, academia. Airbus. Scuba That's the diving. sector itself. Interesting. <laughs> the scuba diving sector. Very cool. Okay. Um, Thanks yeah. for adding in the chat as well. Those of you who are not using the slider, that's also completely fine to, to keep adding in the chat. Go ahead. It's great to see art. So many uh, have added art, which is nice. Quite diverse. So it's great to know you all a little more. Thank you so much for participating in the Slido. Uh, it's a, a great way for Owen and myself to understand a bit more what you're interested in, where you come from, why you're here. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, we'll keep using the Slido during uh, the presentations just to ask you a few additional questions. So uh, please keep it aside on your phone or on your computer and we'll come back to it a bit later. Uh, so now that we know each other a little better, Owen and I feel like we need to be real and honest with you. So you're all here because you want tips, but you can't simply get tips for astronaut selection. <laughs> so Owen and I have done a little bit of research and we are very sorry to say there are no magic tips to succeed at the astronaut selection. But the main tip we will be sharing with you today, and we're really happy that you're here for that, is information. The best way to prepare your application for the astronaut selection is to know what you're applying for and how your profile can be of interest for the selection. So this evening with our guests, we will be telling you a little more about that and uh, how you can understand better what the job really is about in order to prepare your application uh, knowing what you're applying for. So very sorry for everyone that thought this might be uh, the magic hack to becoming an astronaut. It is the 1st of April, so April's full, <laughs> but uh, please stay tuned and our guests will be giving you a lot of information about the job itself and uh, also about what a potential uh, selection process could look like. We do, we do have one, one very small tip and it, it may be overlooked, but it, it's simple in the fact uh, in apply. The amount of people that are overlooking actually applying, it's, it's huge. So uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later, but I'll, I'll hand you back to Charlotte. Yeah, so I can see someone asking if we can ask questions in the chat. Yes, please keep asking questions in the chat. Our team will be looking at them and uh, keeping them for later on. So before we uh, keep going, I'd like to uh, quickly introduce our speakers today. Thank you so much to the three of you for being here. It's a real pleasure to host you. Owen and myself are really excited to hear about your experiences and your stories. Uh, so uh, today we welcome Romain Charles. Hello, Romain. Uh, Romain is from uh, Spaceship France uh, and is a support officer for CNES at MIDES, the Institute for Space Medicine and Physiology in France. Hi Romain, thank you so much for joining. Thank uh, you, hello everybody, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so we also will be receiving Dr. Volker Daman, uh, the former head of crew medical support at the European Astronaut Centre. Uh, and also a fantastic professor that Owen and myself had had the pleasure to listen uh, to at the International Space University. Thank you so much, Volker, for joining. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to host you here today. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte and uh, Owen. It's great being together again with you guys. It was always fun. Indeed. And finally, we will be uh, listening to Laura André Boyer, uh, astronaut instructor at the European Astronaut Centre, but also a parabolic flight instructor at Novispace. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, uh, Charlotte. Uh, hi, everyone. That's my pleasure as well to, uh, to be talking with you guys this evening. Thanks. So before we listen to the three of you, I'd like to tell our audience a little more about the Space Generation Advisory Council, which is the great organization that is allowing us to do this event here today. Uh, so the SGAC, Space Generation Advisory Council, is a uh, global non-governmental and non-profit organization uh, and a network that represents the young generation to the United Nations, but also to space agencies, industry and academia. 
It's composed of students, but also young professionals that are between 18 and 35 years old. Um, and the SJC represents over 150 countries and 15,000 members, if not more. We have multiple partnerships within uh, the space sector. It's a mostly volunteer based organization uh, with which we organize a lot of events. Uh, lately, it's been a lot of online events, but usually we organize in-person events uh, for which we have multiple scholarships. So for our events, but also for other events in the space sector, for trainings, uh, for different uh, competitions. So if you are a young professional or a student looking for a scholarship, you can also have a look at the SJC website. And finally, to tell you a bit more about what we do, SJC is a huge organization that has at least 10 project groups. So everyone can find what they're interested in at SJC, uh, from medicine to ethics, to art, to earth observation, cybersecurity, all of it's there. And uh, our giant leap is one of the initiatives within SGAC. So specifically, our giant leap focuses on promoting diversity and inclusion in the aerospace sector. It's quite a recent initiative. It's been um, around for about two years now. And we work on three main long-term projects that anyone can join. So if you're interested in joining uh, our giant leap, please uh, click on the Slack link that the team will be sending to you in the chat. It's open to everyone, even if you're not between 18 and 35, you're more than welcome to join, to look at what we're doing, to participate in the discussions, to ask questions and uh, to have a look at all of the material that we are sharing with our team and our fellow members. We do a lot of communication and outreach. Our Giant Leap uh, tries to reach out to all of the communities that could be interested in space, be it young children or uh, older professionals who can mentor uh, young professionals in the space sector. And uh, we also organize multiple events like the one we're organizing today. But we also had the opportunity to organize an in-person event not so long ago that was more or less the kickoff of our Giant Leap in Toulouse in September 2020. It was a great pleasure to recruit uh, new members to our Giant Leap during this event. So if you would like after this event to um, participate in our Giant Leap, feel free to click on the link, join Slack, have a chat with us and uh, see how you can contribute. So to tell you a little bit more about the objectives of this specific webinar and astronaut selection related project at our Giant Leap, it's to promote the astronaut careers to young girls and qualified women, to support the development of research related to women astronauts. If you want to understand why we need more research on women astronauts, please look at episode one of this webinar. And finally, to increase the number of women applicants to the next astronaut campaigns. And in this, we uh, have quite a global approach and we're also addressing both public and private astronaut selections. So if this is something that you're interested in and you want to participate in, please feel free to uh, join our giant leap. So to tell you a little bit more about this specific series, episode one, as I said, was about why do we need more women astronauts? Today is the magic tips to how to become an astronaut, but mostly information on what the job really is about, as you understood. And uh, finally, episode three will be about candidate profiles. So we'd like you to meet fellow SGAC members who will be applying to the selection in order for you to understand a little bit more the diversity of potential and profile for these types of positions. So before we uh, go on to talk a little bit more about the selection, we're coming back to the Slido. We would really, really like to know if you're here because you are yourself applying to the ESA astronaut selection. So please, please tell us. Oh, wow, 100% yes so far. <laughs> Undecided, okay. A few no's, but still interested, it seems. So, so far, 63 people have responded. Out, out of 76 people, 84% will be applying. Uh, that's to be expected, we see in the audience and the title of the webinar. But um, maybe maybe these undecided people or, or these people who have replied no, 
uh, we, can, we can convince you as, as to why it is so important to apply, to even just take that first step in, in applying. And, and we really want to try and increase the diversity of applicants for this, for this selection. Okay, so it looks it looks majority yes. Um, again, to be expected. So our second question, uh, what we have is, uh, when it comes up now, uh, would you be interested in applying to other human spaceflight related roles? And um, so this is just good to know, obviously a lot of people here are interested in astronaut selection, but there's actually a huge amount of human spaceflight roles that aren't astronauts. And um, obviously there's a huge, huge amount of jobs and people behind every single spaceflight mission. Uh, and, and, and I think it's important people are aware of those different roles and just, just to see if people are interested in them in general. And there's so many things you can participate in. Uh, I've had myself experience in supporting uh, human spaceflight from a legal perspective. So if you're not necessarily in STEM, but are still interested in space, uh, know that there is, uh, there is space for you too. Okay, so 92 people, I think 80% 80, 80 said yes, which is, which is great to see. Uh, it's, a, it's a super cool industry and, and the more people involved, the better. Um, okay, with that, uh, we'll carry on. So uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the actual ESA Astronaut Selection 2021. So in case you haven't heard, um, or maybe you're just not familiar at all, ESA have opened their astronaut selection. So they opened yesterday, the 31st of March, and the application closes on the 28th of May. And so this is about two months that we're in now. So applications are open. ESA are looking for four ESA staff astronauts. Uh, for the first time, they're looking for 20 reserve astronauts. And as well, they've also launched the Para Astronaut Fly Feasibility Project, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so the requirements are as follows, uh, very basically, um, and again, all this information you can find on the ESA site, but you must be a citizen of an ESA member state. Uh, you have to have a master's degree or higher in natural sciences, engineering, maths, computer science, or an experimental test pilot degree. Uh, you have to have three years relevant postgraduate experience, fluent in English with uh, knowledge of an additional, additional language being an asset. And as well, there's other things like um, you must be flexible with regards to your play work. You have to be calm under pressure and willing to participate in life science experiments. Uh, so as I mentioned, we also, uh, they've launched the Para Astronaut Fly Feasibility Project. Um, so ESA is, ESA is launching a call for interest for individuals who are uh, physio physiologically, cognitively, technically, and professionally uh, qualified to be an astronaut, but who live with physical disability that would normally prevent them from being selected due to requirements imposed uh, by the use of current space hardware. So the selected candidates will work with ESA to assess and optimize the conditions allowing people uh, with physical, physical disabilities to work and live in space. Um, so the application uh, for the educational and uh, physiological or psychological requirements uh, for these candidates as the same uh, are the same for the normal ESA selection um, with respect to the physical requirements. Um, so the feasibility will allow the inclusion of candidates with the following disabilities. So you can see this in the bottom right here. So a lower limb uh, deficiency as following. So single or double foot deficiency uh, through the ankle, single or du uh, double leg deficiency below the knee, or a pronounced leg uh, length difference or a short stature of less than 130 centimeters. Um, so ESA have announced this for time uh, and, and it's very much in line with what we see at our giant leap as, as more diversity in spaceflight. Uh, in addition with our giant leap and more diversity, uh, ESA are really looking, are having a strong focus on getting women to apply, uh, which is what we want to see. Um, so to date, ESA has only had two female uh, astronauts. And in the last selection, only 16% of the applicants uh, were, were women. So due to the nature of the selection, it's, it's, uh, it's very, very high requirements for a candidate. So you could have 10, 10 say, women who apply who are, who are professionally qualified, but they might just not meet the medical criteria. So the more people that apply, the more chance they have being selected. So this is why it's why it's so important for, for everyone to apply, especially if, if, if you're if from a diverse background, if you're female, regardless of your gender, if you're thinking of applying, applying is the very first step you must take. Um, so as we talked about in our last web, webinar, uh, diverse backgrounds are, are key to have women, more women astronauts. That was one of the main outcomes of the webinar. So this is why we need more people to apply to have more diversity. Uh, this is applicable, applicable for any team, but especially in space as well. Uh, and again, as Charlotte mentioned, if you're interested in this talk, you can find that in our last, in our last webinar. So the actual process for the, uh, this selection in 2021 uh, consists of six stages. And this is, this is meant to, uh, to take for about a year, uh, ESA stated. So the first stage where we're at now is the screening. So this is the application online. 
Um, and then the next three stages are tests. So the first one are initial tests, looking at cognitive tests. Uh, then there's an assessment center, uh, and then it goes on to the medical tests. So these, these are the three big stages. And then uh, provided you get through that, then there's a panel, two interview stages. So the first one is a panel interview that looks at your behavioral competencies and your technical ability. And then the final is an interview with the director general of ESA, uh, after which the final decision will be taken. Uh, now, this may seem like a long process, but don't worry about any of that. Uh, it's stage one here. That's where we're at now, and that all you need to worry about. Uh, so stage one is pretty much this here. It's the vacancy notice on the ESA website. Um, and why I was saying earlier, it's so, so important to announce. So Thomas Pesquet, the current ESA astronaut, uh, has had a, had a quote earlier that was very good. So it's one in 1,000 people roughly uh, get selected for astronaut selection. So, so it seems quite hard. But actually, that's not the hardest part of selection. Uh, so the hardest part of selection is applying. So it's actually one in one million people uh, apply for astronaut selection. So if you apply, you've already beaten 999,999 other people. So all you have to do is apply to astronaut selection, and you've already beat the majority of people. So what you have to do for both is create an account, fill the online questionnaire, upload your Europass CV, a motivation letter, and a copy of your passport. Then for the vacancy of astronauts, you need a class two uh, private private pilot certificate. And uh, for the vacancy of astronaut with a physical disability, you have to show a standard medical certificate that's saying, uh, if, it, if not for your disability, you would be able to get a private pilot's license and also a medical file with the details of your disability. So that's pretty much the basis of the selection. All this information and more, including salary scale, uh, height requirements, et cetera, et cetera, are available on the ESA's application handbook. Uh, you might be able to see the link in the chat. Um, but you can find all this information and a vast amount more, um, and this is where you'll get all your information. So with that, um, we're now on to the part so you're all here for, and um, to listen to our speakers. Uh, so I'll introduce our first speaker, uh, who we, you've all introduced as Roman Charles. Uh, so Roman is of French nationality and received a master's degree in engineering from the French Institute of Advanced Mechatronics in uh, Clermont-Ferrand uh, in France, and worked for six years in the automotive industry as a qualified engineer. In 2010, he was selected by the European Space Agency to become the flight engineer of the Mars 500 crew. Uh, this mission of 520 days sim uh, simula uh, simulated a journey to Mars between the 3rd of June 2010 and the 4th of November in 2011. For more than seven years, he would then worked as a crew support engineer at the European Astronaut Centre in Cologne in Germany. His task covered the management of European space food, the upload of private items to the astronauts, the organization of and participation in the launch and landing campaigns in Kazakhstan, and the organization of all the private video conferences between the astronauts' families and the ISS. He's now helping Kinez in, uh, to create the Spaceship F4 structure in Toulouse, France. The goal of the Spaceship Network, coordinated by ESA, is to prepare the future of exploration. Uh, I've worked with Roman a lot, and I've also heard uh, his, his stories about the Mars 500 missions, uh, which is super, super exciting. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to this. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Roman, so you should be able to, to start sharing. Thank you very much, Joanne. I feel like you told my whole life uh, so nicely and quickly that I don't have a lot to say anymore. But um, I will dive deep in the Mars 500 story, and I will try to focus on the selection because it looks like this is the topic for today. Um, so. As you said, my name is Roman Charles, and uh, right now, uh, before jumping into the story, please um, um, be introduced to the final Mars 500 crew, uh, the one which did the 520-day study. So Mars 500 was um, a scientific study which was organized by the Institute of Biomedical Pro uh, Problems in Russia, uh, jointly um, sorry, quickly joined by ESA um, and further down the line by the Astronaut Center of China. And the final crew is representing those different countries. So you have in the bottom center, and I'm sure some people here will be able to um, read his name, Alexei Sityov, our commander. I think we lost Roman. Roman, can you hear us? Okay, sounds like it sounds like we lost Roman. We'll just hang on one second if he if he can't get Roman back. Uh, I'll just send him a quick message. Right, right. Uh, just myself. Uh, you're uh, back. The... Roman, ah, can you sorry. can you hear us? Yes. Sorry, yeah. did I jump? Okay. Yeah, yeah we we lost you there for about thirty seconds. Okay, so. 
the crew, I will not read again all the names, but that was the final crew of Mars 100. So 520 days to simulate a return trip to Mars. This scientific mission was trying to answer a big question. This big question was, is man psychologically and physiologically able to endure the confinement of a trip to Mars? So in other words, can we spend one year and a half in a in a tin can with the five other persons without killing each other and still working efficiently together. And spoiler alert, um, it, the answer is yes. Uh, Mars 500 was a success because we were six when we entered and we're still six when we exited um, a year and a half later. So this is just the general story of Mars 500. Now the Modules, just where did we live? I will go quickly there because I don't think this is the main topic for the discussion. Um, this, on the top right corner, you can see, actually I can show, I think with my mouse, a uh, picture of the um, modules from the outside. On the top left, you can see a schematic showing the, the main module. So the storage module was full of uh, shelves where all the food and equipment and clothes were. This one, the living module, uh, habitable module was the most important for us. It was roughly the size of a bus as uh, we, um, well, that's where we live. This is where you had one um, control room one bedroom, six room, one kitchen, and one living room. And at the back, the medical module, which had um, the, um, the, which were, was a place where we're doing our work. So I'm just looking at uh, the screen to see if uh, everybody's uh, still following. Um, you have some pictures from the inside of um, the, the module down there. And um, those, were taken on a day when uh, the cleaning was done so that it would be all shiny for you to, um, to enjoy this view. So you have the crew, you have the frame, but what really happened? So let's, step, let's take a few steps back. The selection for Mars 500 started a bit like the astronaut selection. So um, the first step was a call for candidates on the ESA website. And at that time, I was a quality engineer in the automotive industry, and I wanted to get closer to this space world. So I thought, I don't think I can be selected, but maybe I could go through one or two steps, get to know a few people that may help me to find a job in this sector that was uh, so appealing to me. And, and so I looked at what was needed, and I said, OK, let's go. And I, and I applied, and that was a lot of questions, and um, you needed still this certificate, medical certificate, but went for it. Second step of the Mars 500 selection was a phone call. I must admit, uh, I think it was like um, an interview, um, but it felt more like they were trying to be sure that I could speak English first, and that I understood that it was a year and a half. Uh, like I understood what was the purpose of this, um, of this study. My answers were, yes, I understand. I still want to apply. And so I was invited to the next one. The next um, step was a psychological interview. So for this one, I was invited to the European Astronaut Center in Cologne for the first time in my life. And that was quite um, a strong, strong moment. Still plenty of little stories to, to, to talk about uh, around that. Um, but basically, it was some questionnaires and then an interview with a lot of people, eight people in front of me shooting questions about who I was, my motivations, plenty of different things. Um, yeah, one, one question stuck to me. One question seemed quite strange for me as a quality engineer. Um, I was asked, in your life, did you ever have a situation um, where you had you know, to take a decision which had uh, life or death uh, consequences for you or for others? And quality engineer, I said, I don't know. I had a car car crash once. Maybe that counts. I don't know. And uh, so I think that the main reason, and maybe Volker will um, will talk a bit more about that. It was to to see how I would react uh, in such a situation. But fact is, 
I didn't have um, such a, a great example to give, but that was a strange question for me. Next step, I might spend a, a bit more time on this one. For the next step, we were invited, all the, the European candidates, to Russia to spend a week and a half in a hospital. So you can see on the picture on the left, a nice building in the back. It was in January, so it was all cold and snow outside. Um, and so we arrived, we were four European candidates and uh, we arrived on Monday morning. And one of the candidates that you cannot see here uh, came to see the, the rest of us at lunchtime saying, okay guys, um, yeah, it was great to meet with you, but I'm going back to, uh, to Europe right now because I have a cold and uh, the doctors cannot do the tests as uh, they should, so um, I'm out. And we were full of energy and happy to be there and, and ready to take on all the tests, but this, uh, this was um, a very strong moment because we understood that you, you have to be prepared, but there is some luck like uh, you have to be careful not having a cold on the week when you do the, the medical screening those little things didn't even cross my mind before arriving to uh, to russia so uh, so that was um uh, like a reality call like poof, all of a sudden we're back into those tests and trying to do the best uh, as we could and um and the story is that we went through all the tests and each time it was okay, it was okay. And I can just thank, I don't know, my parents um, for that because uh, you can't do a lot when, it's, uh, when it comes to the medical test. And on the last test, on the last day, so the next week on Monday, um, just before lunchtime, I did an ultrasound. And a few minutes later, I was called in the, um, in the office of the doctor saying, you have something there is 95% chances that it's nothing, but it could be something that evolved during a year and a half. So we cannot take any chance. So thank you and goodbye. Mars 300 is finished for you. And it was the last test and I was like, I was down. And because it was the last day, um, ISA had planned for us to visit the facility. So the Mars 300 modules. And because I was out, but I was anyway going back home on that evening, I was invited to visit everything. And, and it was like, look, look at everything that you will never have. So I was a bit down. The other guys that you can see, uh, Jerome and Diego, they were cheering me up saying, ah, just try to see a specialist in France and maybe they can um, uh, green light you and, and you can come back into the, into the race. And I was like, you know, looking for a specialist in France, if it's not life or death, um, I will have an appointment in, in three months. And the training for Mars 500 was starting two weeks later. So I left Russia down. And on the plane that brought me back to, uh, to France, I thought, okay, I don't want to have any regrets. So I will try to have an appointment as early as possible. And anyway, I'd like to know what do I have? There is a high chance it's nothing, but just in case. So I went for that. I don't want to have any regrets. So I did a few phone calls and a friend of my parents was working with a specialist and um, called her and called me back 10 minutes later saying, well, actually one of her patients just canceled. Um, so she can take you tomorrow if you want. And I jumped on it. I said, yes, I'm going. It was like 150 kilometers away from my home and I had to work, but I said, I just, I just want to go for it. And I drove and I did, um, I saw the doctor who looked at the document saying, yeah, I, I see what it is. Yeah, I, in fact, um, you're right. There is 95% chance that it's nothing, but it could be something. But to be sure, I need to do a biopsy. And for that, I need special equipment and I can only do that on Wednesdays. And she looked at her calendar and once again, well, actually next Wednesday, if you want, um, one of my patients just canceled so I can put you there. And I was like, yes, <laughs> once again, I will have to do 300 kilometers in one day, but yes, let's do it. Uh, I could feel like maybe there is a small chance, but I didn't want to put too much, uh, too much hope either. So, I went back to my life and the next week I went to do the test and she told me, okay, so now we'll send um, uh, the samples and I will have the results in, in a week. 
and I was, if you count the days, I was like, no, but but the training is starting like next weekend. Uh, have all the, the participants, they are going next weekend to Moscow. Or is there a way to, to get the results faster? And she said, no, no, it's an independent laboratory. I cannot uh, push for anything like that. So it's in a week and I cannot do better. So I said, okay. And on that evening, I sent an email to ISA, to the, my point of contact at ISA, the project leader for Mars 100, saying, here I am, I am back in France, and I saw a specialist, and the test was done, and I'm sure it will be nothing. Uh, I will have the results soon, so if you need me, I'm available. And I just you know, threw a bottle uh, to the sea, and, and let's see what happens. And I went back to, to my work. And on the weekend, I was still in contact with Jerome and Diego, and they told me, oh, yeah, we are going to Moscow. And then, oh, yeah, we are in Moscow. And then, oh, yeah, we're starting the training. And so for me, that was it. That was it. And uh, they started. It was a great adventure. I had a few points of contact, so I could maybe uh, try to reach out a bit later. But I had work to do. And the next week, on the Wednesday, I received a phone call, plus 31. Plus 31, that's, that's the Netherlands, oh, ESA. So I took the phone and uh, it was a project leader saying, yeah, so do you have the results? Because, you know, if it's nothing, you're in. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. So I called back the specialist who said, yeah, I just received them. And she looked at them and said, yeah, no, it's nothing. And I was like, oh, can you send me the documents? I need to, to um, provide that to ESA so that I can uh, be back in the, in, in the race. And um, and she told me, no, I don't have a scanner. I cannot do it. And this time I was like 400 kilometers away. I just couldn't do it in the, in the same day. So, so I did what everybody would do in my position. I took my phone and, uh, and said, hello, ma'am. Could you please go there, take this uh, document, scan it wherever you want, and just send it to me so that I can um, be back in, in the race for, um, for Mars 100. And, and she did it. And in the evening, I tried to translate the, the medical documents and that to ISA. And uh, three days later, I was in Moscow with those guys. What I didn't know at that time is that a fourth candidate started, but um, left uh, the selection for Mars 100. Um, he had all the priorities. He didn't find it um, his, uh, at his liking, I would say. And then I was in, back in. And then I could start the training with 11 candidates. And that's a different thing compared to an astronaut selection that we started the training for Mars 100. So that specific training, we were still 11. And only one month before entering the modules, uh, did they extract out of those 11 candidates, the six members, uh, which were Diego, bottom right, um, uh, Alexei, Alexander, Vanue, Sukrab, and myself. And then Mars 500, the story, uh, the, the adventure, or the motionless trip could start. So on the 3rd of June 2010, we entered the, um, uh, the utility module, so the storage module, and the door behind me was closed for 520 days. So what we did inside were uh, experiments. We did a lot of uh, different experiments, uh, mainly about psychology, about physiology. And here you see Diego and Vanue, or at least Diego preparing a uh, physiology uh, experiment for Vanue uh, related to sport. And he would do an EEG, an electroencephalogram before sport and after sport to see the effect of sport and, and is this effect uh, impacted by the confinement after a long period. So that was what we were doing, and we started to have a small routine inside those modules, and to break this routine that can become monotonous and that can become boring, we would try to have some events. We would try to create those events. So here, it's a picture of uh, Halloween. Uh, for none of our countries, Halloween is a, a big tradition. It's becoming a big tradition, but it's more um, uh, coming from, from the USA. Um, but still, we said, why not? Let's put on some costume during the day. And in the evening, let's watch some horror movies. And, and we really enjoyed that because it was a different day. It made it different. And that would give us some energy 
for the next uh, for the next days and weeks and months. And little by little, we arrived to our goal, Mars. After more than eight months, three of us went into a smaller module, the Martian lander, where they stayed confined for two weeks. And three times during those two weeks, they put on their Orlan E spacesuit and they went on EVA on the Martian surface, so uh, on a, a big dome into, um, into which they could um, do some everything that an astronaut would do on, on the Mars planet. So um, planting a flag and um, telling some inspiring quote and then getting, you know, uh, uh, taking some, some rocks on the floor. And then they came back to our modules and that was our trip back. So on this picture, you see the, the living module. Um, on the right, you have the hatch going to the storage module. On the left, you have this corridor and you have to imagine um, doors leading to our different rooms there. And it was a bit harder for me. One, one of the difficult moments was one year after entering the modules. And that's because um, at that time, at that moment, we received a lot of messages from family and friends saying, yeah, great, continue like that. It's been a year, um, we are with you. And journalists would especially, would especially ask the question, so tell us what happened what happened during that year and how do you foresee the, five, uh, the 155 days ahead of you? And doing that, they obliged us to do something that we wouldn't do inside the modules. We were living the present. We were living each day one after another and not looking at the big picture. And asking those questions would um, oblige us to look at everything that happened during that year. And in fact, you look at everything that you missed from the outside during that year. And 155 days ahead of you, that's still five months. That's not a small period. So for me, um, during that period, I was more grumpy. I had less patience with, uh, uh, with the other crew members. But luckily, as a team, we all had ups and downs, but not at the same time. So we could always help each other to go through uh, those, those difficult moments. And after days, one plus one plus one plus one, that's 520 days. And on the 4th of November, 2011, so a bit less than 10 years ago, we exited the modules and that was rediscovering all the little things that we didn't have for a year and a half. We're just um, um, enjoying the food with the explosion of flavors and, and enjoying the first sunrise was so magical. So this, um, this day and, and the few days that followed were, were just, just great. And, and because I, you know, as I said at the beginning, the mission was a success. So it was even adding some, uh, uh, some energy to the whole thing. Thanks to the Mars 500, I managed or I could apply for the position of uh, crew support engineer at the European Astronaut Center in, in Cologne. Um, I was already MEDES as, um, at that time, so Medicine Spatiale. And my job as a crew support engineer was to facilitate the daily life of the astronauts. Um, so here I like this picture because, you know, I'm doing my job for, for Thomas Pesquet uh, when he's uh, on his first mission. So was, when he was just back in, on Earth uh, and I'm literally supporting him, like holding the chair, which was quite heavy, I must admit. It was a metallic chair. Um, now I'm in Toulouse, uh, helping Knes to create this uh, structure, Spaceship EFA, to prepare the future of exploration. But I will not talk longer because I'm sure that uh, uh, the next, uh, uh, next one in line will have so many things to say. So thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to give back the screen. Lovely, Roman. Thanks, thanks a million. Um, yeah, I know. I, I personally, I've, I've heard stories of your Mars 500 before, but it, it's, it's truly an amazing story. Uh, I don't know if I could personally do 520 days, but um, I, I, you look like a man who hasn't done 520 days. Uh, let's <laughs> wait. Uh, so guys, we're, we're getting loads and loads of questions in the chat, which is really good to see. And, and thanks to Nicola and Tanya in the back 
uh, who are organizing the question. One thing to point out before we go to our next speaker. Um, so none of our speakers today are involved in, in the selection and therefore they, and, and no one here, as far as I know, know the background of what's exactly required. Uh, so, so just for example, uh, questions like uh, how, how should we address our motivation letter? Uh, or how long should our CV be? Or if you have X, Y, Z, can I apply? Uh, unfortunately, no one outside the selection committee knows those answers, uh, and I don't think they'll they'll ever become public. Um, but we are getting some really really good questions. Roman, you've got you've already got about fifty questions asking all about Mar five hundred. So continue to keep those questions in specific to our speakers because because it's really good to get some insight for them. Uh, Even requesting uh, so, a Netflix series, Roman. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Thanks. <laughs> Uh, so we can uh, move on to our next speaker, uh, Professor Volker Damon. A uh, great pleasure to have you here today. Uh, so Professor Damon has dedicated his career to aerospace medicine. He started in 1989 and he served for six years as a space, space flight surgeon at the German Aerospace Research Center, DLR, uh, in eight shuttle and two Soyuz Mir missions. In 1995, he became the lead flight surgeon. And in 1998, he was the head of the crew medical support office at the European Astronaut Center of the European Space Agency in Cologne, Germany. In 20, 2016, he became a full professor for human performance in space at the International Space University in Strasbourg. Uh, that's where Owen and myself had the pleasure to attend some of his lectures. Volker is also a visiting lecturer at the technical universities in Dresden and in Berlin, and he developed a new master's program called Space Physiology and Health with King's College London. He is an ASMA fellow since 2014, a member of the ASMA Executive Committee and vice Vice President of International Services since 2017. Uh, Volker retired from ESA in September 2020, but remains a faculty member at the International Space University. Thanks again, Volker, for being here today. The floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, Charlotte and Owen and everybody else. Uh, I'm just getting a error message here. Uh, okay, now I go. Um, yeah, I also have the uh, presentation um, f uh, which I'm usually giving about the uh, astronaut selection in uh, Strasbourg. So I can also uh, share my screen with you and uh, walk you through a few slides which may already give you some answers to the questions that came up in the, uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, indeed, Charlotte, uh, uh, is right. Uh, none of the three uh, uh, available today are directly involved in the uh, current selection. Um, but at least what I have seen on the website and uh, what you have presented uh, regarding the timeline, uh, it looks as if it's rather the common uh, uh, setup uh, that we used since the late 80s. Why is it this way? Well, um, there are medical standards. Uh, uh, that have been agreed upon by all um, space agencies some years ago. And no matter if you're a Chinese uh, applicant or a European or an American, the medical requirements are, are pretty much identical. So you, you may have different ways of implementing the selection process, but the underlying rule book, so to speak, um, is pretty much similar. And uh, why would you change dramatically um, a process that has been proven to be a good process? Of course, you can always improve and learn, um, but at least the selections that I was involved in, that was a total of four astronaut selections. Um, uh, there were some modifications, but at the end, uh, the, the process remained uh, pretty much um, um, the same. Um, but uh, in 2008, when we had the last ESA selection, uh, it was a very lucky year because all five International Space Station partners had an astronaut selection at the same time, based on the same selection criteria. And it was amazing to see how differently the uh, selection process was implemented by the Canadians, by NASA, uh, by our Russian colleagues, etc. So you may see a different approach um, to um, uh, setting up a, a selection process. But at the end, um, we are all looking for the same 
characteristics uh, of an astronaut. Um, maybe because that is one of the driving factors of today's webinar is uh, uh, how do we, are we able to increase uh, more female applicants? And that was also a driver in the 2008 selection. Uh, we did a lot of marketing, uh, our PR uh, folks were pretty active uh, we went to all different universities in, in, in Europe and trying to promote um, uh, female astronauts. Unfortunately, I have no clue why we failed. Uh, is it a failure or is it just, was it something at still in 2008? We could not attract roughly more than 20% of female applicants. Um, sad, maybe this time, uh, 11 years later, uh, we will uh, hopefully get uh, more female uh, applications in. In general, um, there is no difference in psychological and medical uh, selection criteria for male and females. Um, they're pretty much identical. There may be some subtle changes. Of course, uh, if you do some blood work, etc., cetera, um, you may look at uh, different aspects in females and, and, and males. Um, but in general, um, there is no um, uh, major differences. Um, maybe I'm sharing my screen and walk you through some um, uh, major uh, issues first of all, and then we can uh, talk a little bit more in about specific. So I'm. Yeah. Are you seeing the the screen already? Yeah, we can, yeah. we can see your screen now. Okay, now let me just get my keynote here. Um, first of all, um, very often uh, people only consider medicine and uh, clinical uh, selection criteria, but medicine as defined by the WHO is mental and physical health and not only uh, uh, physical health. So. Uh, the medical selection or the astronaut selection is always combining both the uh, medical part and the psychological part. Um, in Europe and also before in Germany and also in France, when they had their own astronaut selection campaigns in the late uh, 80s or even in the 70s in, in, in Germany, um, the psychological selection was always the first part. Um, and also, if you look into uh, analog environments like um, uh, pilot selections for, for Air France, for Lufthansa, etc., cetera, um, you also start, always start uh, with psychology. The reason is that um, the psych psychological criteria are very, very tough. And you deselect most of the applicants through the psychological selection process. In principle, you have, uh, and just to give you some, some numbers, we roughly had 1,000 people, uh, applicants that went through the first part of the psychological selection and only 43 applicants were remaining after the psychological selection to go into the medical selection. So there you already see how important uh, the psychological part of the selection process is. And I assume having seen the, um, uh, the documentation of ESA, uh, for this round of, of astronaut selection, it appears to be uh, rather similar to what we have done in the, in the past years. There's also another aspect. Uh, as a physician, you should not apply any medical intervention uh, with, without an indication. So if somebody is healthy, uh, you don't start poking around and uh, doing uh, all the fancy stuff that uh, physicians are <laughs> able to do, looking into every opening that your body uh, offers, uh, doing lots of x-ray. So um, that's why you would not start with a medical selection part because you would have roughly a thousand people again. Um, and the risk, the side effects, uh, the potential side effects and risks related to medical uh, um, examinations are just too high. And another uh, aspect is medicine is usually extremely expensive. So you put the medical part for less applicants at the very end. Just to give you some, um, some uh, definitions here, um, 
what is also very important is what uh, is mentioned here, waiver. Uh, this is, has been the case in all countries. It is also in aviation, not only in space. The initial selection, the bar is extremely high that you have to jump over and there is no waiver, no exception to the rules. So you can not in a team or in a selection board and panel uh, waive a certain requirement. You can, if, for example, if it's written that a kidney stone uh, is disqualifying, you cannot say, well, the kidney stone in this applicant, that was 20 years ago when, when that was a juvenile, uh, there are no further indications that another kidney stone will come. So we waive that requirement and that uh, person is um, um, moving forward in the process. So there is under no circumstances any waivers. So if you have a medical deficiency and be it as marginal as you think, uh, there is no further step. And I think that's a little bit what uh, Romain just said in, for his own case. Um, of course, before you make such a decision and deselecting somebody, you just don't do it just out of the blue. That's why usually in the medical uh, process, we give enough time for the uh, clinical examinations. Uh, we try to um, give uh, some rest days. Uh, of course, you don't want to have your dentist appointment when you have uh, uh, received your uh, medication for the gastroscopy or the uh, colon. Uh, endoscopy and you're sitting on the, on the toilet uh, the whole day. So we try to deconflict the timeline. We look into the hormonal status for females, for example, that uh, we always do the, the tests in a certain um, days uh, during the cycle. Um, and if you see any potentially um, disqualifying medical cases. It is not that you just go by the book and see, hey, that's negative and uh, you are out. Uh, we always had enough time to redo an examination or to use an alternative. For example, if you had seen something in ultrasound and you were not really sure, is there something, um, then maybe an x-ray examination, which has a higher radiation dose, of course, and you don't do it in the beginning, but you may then opt for doing something um, in addition. Um, so the role of the uh, physicians and the psychologists is not to kick everybody out. It is also fair um, to not unduly kick somebody out. Um, and um, um, you have to have proof and evidence that what you are doing is meeting um, the uh, medical standards that the international medical board that decides on those selection criteria um, has decided uh, what, are the, what are good selection requirements. Um, there is also an important aspect. You cannot be healthier than somebody else. Uh, so in medicine, it's a pass-fail criteria or a go-no-go. No go. Um, so it's black and white. In psychology, especially if you go into the assessment center, there may be a certain uh, ranking which is used internally uh, among the psychologists to, to evaluate team, team exercises, for example. Uh, but also there is a go-no-go no go at the end, decision at the end. So at the end, the... The last um, candidates that went through psychology and medicine and then have the interviews, they're equally healthy mentally and physically. And I think that's also an important uh, aspect. Thirdly, there is no such thing than a healthy human being. You only have not this person. So if you apply at the end of your 20s, early 30s, which is the normal uh, age range, um, you are already past your, um, let's say, good times. A <laughs> uh, human being is designed to live roughly uh, 25 to 30 years, uh, and then aging starts. And uh, you always find something. You just have to look a little bit harder. So if one of you guys who is listening has any medical issue or thinks there is a medical issue, just forget about it for the time being <clears throat> and apply. Because you never know, first of all, what are the selection requirements? Is what I have or this um, 
pathology or this uh, normal variation that I am, I'm having, uh, maybe it's not that important in the selection process. So just apply. Don't uh, exclude yourself by considering that you may not be fit from a mental or, uh, or a physical point of view. Um, you also will see, um, you will get some questionnaires that was also already mentioned in the, in the call for uh, application. Um, and first of all, don't underestimate the people that do the, um, the uh, selection at ESA. Um, they are professionals and they also know how the internet works. And um, we had people monitoring also all the social media, uh, what people think about the selection process. What are they communicating about questionnaires? And it was really interesting to see um, just um, and a simple questionnaire that we sent out that was about habits, about eating habits, for example. It didn't have anything to do about a go or no go criteria, but we just needed to know what the normal habits were that we could prepare the next steps of the application. And if you then see, and your, our contractor came to us and said, hey, Volker, uh, did you see that on Facebook? Uh, they're just laughing their heads off. Uh, what, what scenario uh, and what questionnaires are sent out and uh, making fun out of you. Well, maybe um, uh, that's something I just want to, uh, you guys to remember, be cautious what you communicate. First of all, ESA will again ask for your signature that you are not communicating anything about the internal processes of the selection process. Um, and if you're caught in the act, uh, this may be the end and we had some cases. So um, take everything that is sent to you uh, serious. Uh, you may think, hey, why are they asking those questions? Um, just fill out the questionnaires. Uh, you will maybe later, uh, two or three months in the process, see, ah, that's why they wanted to know that. Ah, okay, they wanted to give me a special diet uh, because they knew that I'm a vegetarian, for example, and they didn't want to uh, ruin the medical selection by forcing me to eat meat or whatever. So take it serious um, and be honest um, because sooner or later, um, dishonesty um, may, uh, may disqualify you as well. Um, um, I think a dishonest member in a mass 500 study or in an astronaut core um, at least from a psychological point of view, may not be the best suited. Um, so apply, don't uh, diagnose yourself, um, just apply um, and uh, be honest and take the process uh, serious. Um, let me just move forward. Uh, um, this was our diagram at that time, but it more or less matches uh, the same that ESA has now with the different uh, steps with the online application with some basic um, uh, questionnaires that we wanted to understand. Um, also, you have to remember that um, you have the logistics uh, of managing roughly 10, 15,000 applicants online and then having to deal with roughly roughly a thousand applicants going to, uh, to Hamburg, for example, for the psychological testing. Uh, sometimes you need, or we always tried to gather information uh, one or two months before something was happening just to be prepared. Um, so bear uh, with the, uh, the, the folks who are running the, the whole process. And here you just see the numbers that we had. We had uh, roughly a little bit more than 10,000 uh, uh, expected, then we had 8,400 online applications. We ended then with uh, 920 that went to Ham Hamburg for the first psychological testing. Uh, only 190 came out of it. That's also the same number that Air France, Lufthansa and other airlines have in their uh, test, uh, uh, cognitive testing. 45, okay, I was wrong, 45 people in, in medicine. We had 22 that uh, were medically and uh, psychologically fully fit. Um, that's astonished us that uh, so many young people uh, did not meet the medical requirements, but that was primarily due to the fact that we looked 
try to predict um, certain cardiac diseases because we know with our lazy lifestyle, less sport, um, certain uh, nutritional habits that um, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, unfortunately is increasing even in younger people. So we deselected um, some folks uh, that had certain uh, lifestyle, uh, negative lifestyle uh, habits. Maybe their father died of a, a heart attack and they were already borderline with a blood pressure at the age of 30. So we were pretty tough at that point in time and uh, said, okay, that's no go because we want you, you are a career astronaut. ESA wants to keep you in the business for 30 more years. You're supposed to fly two or three times or even maybe four times. Um, so the, the bar, as I said in the beginning, is very high. Once you jump over the bar and are selected, the annual medical um, examination, the requirements are much lower. Of course, if you then develop a certain disease or you have a certain abnormality, um, then we cure it or we, uh, you are taken out of the astronaut uh, rotation and the training for a certain amount of time until a medical um, um, uh, cure has been uh, applied and then you are back in. But the hurdle, the bar at the very beginning is extremely high for good reasons uh, to really select um, somebody where you, okay, you can never be 100% sure, but at least where the uh, risk and the probability to uh, uh, become severely uh, hampered and, and uh, sick uh, already in young ages is very low. Um, just to show you, I don't know if Hamburg, DLI in Hamburg is again the uh, test center uh, where the, uh, the, uh, the cognitive testing is done. Uh, cognitive testing um, is something that ESA um, is pretty much relying on because cognitive functions, and I will give you uh, uh, on the next slide a little idea is meant by that, is something that uh, mom has given you. It's genetic. Uh, it's more or less the hardware and software in your brain, how you approach certain cognitive um, functions in your life. In the very early stages when you're growing up and you're maybe one or two years old, um, the brain is still capable of uh, modifying certain capabilities. But um, uh, the older you get, the less you can modify those cognitive functions. And the cognitive functions we are uh, looking at in aviation and space are very specific ones um, where uh, the ratio of people who do not meet those uh, uh, cognitive functions rather high. Um, and I will, and you just see the room, it's very standardized, climate controlled, etc. also to be very fair to everybody. Um, but it's a very tough week uh, or uh, two days uh, in Hamburg. Just an example of some cognitive uh, tests and cognitive uh, uh, domains is okay, uh, mental arithmetic, memory capability, attention span, perception, spatial uh, perception, decision making, uh, multitasking, etc. And um, <clears throat> for example, even though uh, you may see some dials that look like in aviation, there is nothing um, that makes a pilot better uh, to pass through those tests. Um, all those tests are not built. Um, already with dials and uh, software that goes into the direction of, of piloting a spacecraft or, a, um, or, or an airplane. It's just, for example, here you have to memorize, or let's use this one, you, you, you see those nine dials, uh, round, um, uh, square, black and white, and uh, dial position. It may look like in a cockpit, but the question is at the end, you, you see that for five seconds, and then the question is how many round black uh, dials did you see with a hand on four, uh, four o'clock? Um, so that's memory. That's also a way of uh, how you perceive and uh, process a, an image. This one is a very nice one. You uh, see a cube in 3D uh, with an X on the right hand side. So you see that for a couple of seconds. Okay, you know the cube is, uh, the X is on the right side. Then uh, the, the, the picture goes away and you get an audio sig signal up, left, right, up, down, light, left, right. Where's the X? So you have to rotate the cube 
in your brain. That's a very tough uh, skill. Some people have it, again, uh, a lot of genetics and very early learning and training when you're a, a baby. Um, and uh, some, and uh, you can uh, attend certain training courses uh, to learn. Um, but the problem is, if you don't know where the cutoff is, and what does a normal person remember, um, you can lose a lot of money for training, uh, but you don't get much better. Because, and I now move to this one. If you look at um, the data of those tests, um, you know, you have the Gaussian distribution, um, for example, with this uh, rotation uh, of the cube. And um, if you do not know that usually uh, an, a normal human being cannot remember more than five of those rotations in their brain, you can train and, and you would, so you would be uh, here in, the, uh, in, in this domain, uh, you can train and maybe the next, you have lost uh, 1000 euros and you remember one more of those commands um, in, in your brain, but uh, without losing 1000 euros, you still would have met the requirement because you don't know what is normal in the population, in the European population um, and a comparison group. So that is uh, the big data and the, the, the secret that DLR is sitting on to have those statistics. And of course, uh, before the uh, selection, we use the same tests as uh, airlines use, but we may change uh, who we are going to select. We can say, okay, it, such a certain cognitive skill is so important that we take everybody who is better than the average. And there are certain skills like English language. We also use uh, folks that are less than average because that is a trainable skill. Um, and with that, you can use the same tests, but by moving your window over the Gaussian distribution list, you can adapt it to very specific uh, air traffic controller, um, uh, military pilots, uh, commercial pilots, astronauts. So that's the whole trick. Um, now coming to um, the uh, uh, assessment center, that is something many of you may know if you apply for a job. In, um, in, in industry, very often you go through such an assessment center where um, you either have individual interviews with a psychologist, you may have group interviews, you may have certain tasks you, you as a group have, have to um, satisfy. Um, also there, and, and there we, we, we look at the so-called uh, personalities. Uh, um, are you more a leader or a follower? Um, are you able to be, a, you are a good leader, but uh, can you also take yourself back and be a follower if there is an emergency or if there is something uh, happening? As Romain said, everybody has ups and downs and had tough times. And if you are then somebody who insists, hey, I'm the leader, I'm the boss here, uh, you may have a very big problem uh, on your way to Mars. And of course, if you have in your crew of six people, um, uh, six leaders, uh, that's also a nightmare. So you need to have a good, good mix. Um, uh, of your personality. So the second part is more or less really personality, psychology and uh, uh, personality and not cognitive function. Uh, a last point is then, of course, the, uh, the uh, medical. And um, that is something I'm a little bit proud of. And I saw in the chat already some, some questions, uh, who is paying for that, etc. how much does it cost? Well, you know, um, I'm proud of having that invented at that time because I was scared like hell that after all the media attention we had uh, uh, for the astronaut selection, that a TV truck would, would be in front of the doors in Hamburg and an applicant would come with a wheelchair. Um, so we needed to have at least a minimum of medical certainty that people who apply at least meet the minimum requirements for a private pilot license. Um, and that's why we said, okay, go see your, uh, an aviation physician. Yes, there is a certain uh, cost attached to it. There may be certain uh, countries where uh, those costs are covered. But um, on the other side, 
<clears throat> if you want to become an astronaut, um, you anyhow need to, uh, and Romain uh, mentioned that, uh, you need to drive, <laughs> jump in your car, and then pick up your medical uh, documents and, and drive somewhere, somewhere else. That is also a cost factor. <clears throat> and I think those 100 to uh, 300 euros is also well spent because at least you have a certificate, you know about your medical status and you uh, may sometimes learn something about yourself which you didn't know beforehand. So that's what we did. We then had the uh, medical questionnaires that we sent out and then uh, we sent out more detailed medical questionnaires where it really went into, um, let's say we had, I think roughly 20 questions um, um, which we called so-called no-go criteria. Um, um, are you uh, are you using drugs? Um, do you have diabetes? Did you ever had a suicide attempt, etc.? So um, those questions um, were just for us to to really see. Hey, is there a potential showstopper? Uh, you were not disqualified at that point in time, but at least we could prepare and see: uh, is there any any major hiccup? Um, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Sorry to interrupt, if okay. If if I might, um, if if it's okay with you, I might I might stop you there and jump to Laura, and we we might come back. Yeah. Uh, we can come to you. You've you've got hundreds of questions in the comments already. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are quite upset that uh, being past twenty is past their prime, present company included. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, let, let me just okay. Oh, and I'm and that was anyhow my last one, but just one thought. Um, um, for those questionnaires, again, take them serious and look at the answers. Not always a no or a uh, uh, is correct. Very often people fill out questionnaires. Do you uh, abuse drugs? Uh, are you colorblind, uh, etc.? And they all say, oh, it's all no, 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 no. And then some clever people put two questions in there where you have to answer yes, if you're healthy. So we don't want to have pilots steering an airplane or a spacecraft who are not able to read a procedure and to fill out a questionnaire. So take everything serious and look at the questions and not just answer no because you think you have to answer no uh, for the sake of being healthy. And with that, I stop at this point. Okay, Charlotte and Owen, I. No worries. There. We go. Well, uh, thanks a million. Uh, it's always super, super fascinating. I know uh, this this talk we got in the ISU was just just as fascinating. So thanks. We'll we'll come back to it in, in a minute um, when we have lots of our, uh, lots of questions. Uh, so we'll we'll now jump to our, our next speaker, um, who we have waiting patiently on the side. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, so our next speaker, Laura Andrea Boye, uh, graduated in physiology and biomedical engineering from the Polytechnic School of Grenoble in France and from Polytechnic School of Montreal in Canada. Canada. She started to work at Medes for Kness in 2007, uh, developing, handling, and supporting in real time the human physiology experiments performed on board the ISS. In 2010, she participated in the basic training of the 2009 ESA astronaut class as an anatomy and physiology instructor, and in the same year moved to Cologne to become an astronaut instructor and simulation director at the European Astronaut Centre. In 2012, Laura completed a master's in business and administration at the International Space University, with a thesis on potential medical guidelines for com commercial suborbital spaceflight participants. In addition to her responsibilities at ESA, she founded in 2018 the PASI, a professional association of space instructors, and works as a parabolic flight uh, instructor for Novus Plus and Air Zero G organizations. Um, with that, Laura, I'll hand it over to you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Uh, I've worked some with Laura, and, and every story she comes out with is brilliant. So, Laura, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Owen. Thank you, Charlotte, as well. And I'm super happy to, to see my friends and former colleagues, uh, uh, Volker and Romain, talking with me today. I only have good news for all the participants. Thank you for co connecting as well. The first good news is that I'm going to be a lot shorter than my colleagues and friends uh, because um, I need to, to leave after the, the, the talk quite uh, quickly. And uh, also because I'm dead tired, uh, we just finished the training of uh, Thomas Pesquet. Uh, it was really in a rush. We were really in a hurry. And, and I will directly go to sleep after I'm done with, uh, with this talk. Um, I will share my screen and I will jump directly in the little slides that I've been 
putting together. Can Is there now? Owen or Charlotte yeah. confirm? All yeah, good? Nice we Perfect. can see your Thank slides. You Thanks. Okay. Super. Thanks. So I'm going to give you uh, some insights about my job. So I am an astronaut instructor and simulation director at the European Astronaut Center. And I'm going to give to the lucky ones, maybe or maybe not so lucky, let's decide after this presentation, uh, that will be selected where they're going to be working and uh, what they will be doing. So. I uh, work at the European Astronaut Center. This is a, a building that is located in Cologne in Germany, uh, where we are hosting, of course, our European astronauts, but also all the astronauts that will fly on board the ISS. That means that it's not only a training center for European astronauts, but for every astronaut. This is mandatory for them to come and to receive training about European equipment and activities. So at the EAC, we have, uh, as you can see here, a big garage hall, training hall, where we have those big mock-ups, uh, where we are training uh, on flight-like equipment, um, our, our astronauts, our trainees. Of course, we very often see those pictures about the NBF, the Neutral Buoyancy Facility. This is the big swimming pool where we are pre-training, I am not doing that, but uh, my, my colleagues are pre-training the astronauts in their EVA training that they will receive uh, mainly in Houston. So that's it for the location. And there we jump directly into the, into the, the, the work. So my job is astronaut instructor. I'm simply a teacher with uh, very small classes of one or maximum two pupils. So that's very comfortable. Uh, the less comfortable thing is that those trainee, those pupils are extremely demanding, extremely smart and have a lot of questions. So but that's, uh, that's reassuring and pretty normal for astronauts. So I just wanted to show you a few pictures. I only have pictures in this presentation uh, and illustration about what it is to train as an astronaut. So the idea, the overall idea is to train our astronaut on the ground um, to accomplish what they will be doing on board the ISS. Uh, so here, this is a, a neuroscience um, experiment named GRASP. And as you see, we're rehearsing with Tuma, we're exercising in the performance so that he feels absolutely comfortable to reproduce the same protocol on board the ISS. I have a little video. So this one is very recent, as you can see with the masks. So classroom training, uh, it was just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, we're just together. We talk about the science, the benefits, why he's going to be doing this activity on board. And here are the questions. So they always have a lot of questions. We have to review all the operational uh, documents. So of course, the procedure that they will be using. And finally, we are training together the performance of the activity. So here we have a picture again about uh, the training of David Saint-Jacques, uh, a Canadian astronaut. And um, as you can guess here, this is a big ultrasound machine. So luckily, David is uh, also a medical doctor, but not every astronaut are medical doctors. Therefore, um, we need to find solution, especially when we want to do ultrasound images. They're not all trained to actually perform those uh, uh, activities, and we don't have the time to train them as radiologists. So that's just not possible. So we have such a device like this that is remote guided from the ground with less than one second delay. And the astronaut just positioned the probe on the acoustic window. And uh, from the ground, they're directly remote controlling uh, the probe. So pretty neat device. My uh, second uh, activity, my second duty at the EAC is simulation director. So we don't only need to train astronauts to perform uh, and to accomplish their missions. We also need to train all the people that are working on the ground. Uh, there are many, there are many uh, uh, little centers everywhere in Europe and of course in, in, uh, 
in uh, in the US as well. But uh, for us at ESA, we only focus on the user support operation centers and the Columbus Control Center. They receive a large and, and a long theoretical training with a lot of exams. And after the theoretical training, they will enter a practical training by means of simulations that are European or international. And my job is to um, imagine scenarios that are all catastrophic for this uh, uh, simulation and to rate, to evaluate those, um, uh, those uh, ground controllers to make sure that they're able to perform, to do their job in nominal and also in off nominal, uh, very degraded situations. So this is our little uh, simulation room. And uh, yeah, we're that many <laughs> and without masks, so as you can see, it was uh, uh, before COVID, but yeah, we have uh, sim directors, sim officers, and we are just uh, throwing uh, catastrophic situation failures to, to these uh, uh, poor ground support personnel, very, very fun activity and extremely demanding as well. I also have another uh, another professional life. So I have my professional life at the EAC as an instructor and simulation director. And my other uh, professional life is uh, as founder of the PASI, the Professional Association of Space Instructors. Uh, this organization aims at um, uh, the democratization of space expertise and knowledge for professionals and also for individuals. Um, as part of, of, uh, of the PASI, I am lucky enough to be an astronaut, uh, to be a parabolic flight uh, instructor as well. So I started to work uh, as an instructor for Novispas uh, a few years ago, three, three years ago. And uh, yeah, I, I would say that's definitely the, the my favorite activity. So I am training uh, like like I do train the astronaut to make them ready to uh, handle their flight. And I uh, accompany them uh, into some fun activities as well. So uh, during the flight, uh, during the flight as well. So pretty cool. And um, I just wanted to show you this uh, picture. So being a uh, so you can see the astronaut Jean-François Clairvoy, and here is uh, Nadege Moulin. So it was a few years ago. I uh, was offered to organize a very special parabolic flight campaign dedicated to disabled kids. So we've been select selecting across Europe those uh, those kids that uh, were uh, paraplegic, tetraplegic, um, that had yeah mental disabilities. And uh, we were very lucky to fly with them, to accompany them and, uh, and to see those uh, smiles. So yeah, here Nadej is just standing on her own uh, uh, in, uh, in zero G. So that was a very, very nice, uh, very nice activity. And I think this is the end for my short presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Laura. Very, very timely indeed. Um, would you have time for one quick question or two? Absolutely, yeah. A couple so, of questions and then I go, I go to bed. So we have so many people who are absolutely fascinated with the job of uh, astronaut trainer, haven't necessarily heard about it that much before, and who uh, were wondering, how did you come about to become an astronaut trainer? What is uh, your background? What did you study? So this is my secret goal attending this uh, uh, this conference today is to to actually make the people realize that the best job is not astronaut. This is astronaut instructor, the best one. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> and I'm honest. I'm being honest. Um, being also honest uh, is to say that I have never aimed at working in the uh, in the uh, human spaceflight industry before falling in it. So. Um, that's pretty unfair for all the people that have been trying or that, I, that are trying. So I'm, I'm very sorry, but um, it was just like this. I studied physiology, as you say, and, and engineering. And at the end of my studies, I had to do an internship. And I did this internship at CNES Toulouse in the Cadmos Center. So the French people know the Cadmos. It's very... Um, very much on, on TV and on the internet. And I was hired by Medes, so the same employer as, uh, as uh, Romain. And um, 
so I started my my career there and my career I started to work there uh, and uh, after actually my my internship there was uh, the international um, student contest at the EAC and uh, I won the prize there so this is what brought me in actually so uh, it was just uh, out of the blue just daring just giving my best and being being simple be, being a good team member and um, and it's not because you're 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 just uh, completely out of this focus or that it's not your target to do that that you shall not dare to do it so yeah just uh, being a, a normal person normally working person and being uh, uh, nice and friendly was uh, was enough so I'm very, I'm very happy for that. And um, I spent three years working uh, at CNES as an experiment activities manager. And um, I participated to, I volunteered to participate to the basic training of the 2009 class. Um, so I taught physiology and anatomy. And after this, there was an open position as an uh, instructor. I applied and I got it. Simple, straightforward, nothing, nothing special. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. So a lot of people are asking, do you know if there's any open positions as well right now for astronaut trainers? Now people are wondering, when is the next astronaut trainer selection coming up? Any insights on that? Um, so there, there are astronaut trainers, and usually we use this term for sport trainers. Um, our team is astronaut uh, instructors. Currently, there are none, but I wish there would be because we, we're we're dead and if there are any i will pass you the uh, uh, the information but um usually it's uh it's uh yeah massively published and uh yeah go for it apply for astronaut selection if you want but like get to the cool thing as well <laughs> thank you so much for, <laughs> no, for that's your presentation um my pleasure thank you very much and uh, yeah yeah, Laura, I think, I think uh, we, we won't keep you any longer because we know you're already over time. But I think, I think just on behalf of everyone, we'll, we'll go to the Q&A in a minute. But just on behalf of everyone, in our 184 participants, everyone sounds, says your job sounds amazing. Uh, I think everyone wants to be a trainer now and not an astronaut. Um, but, but just a huge thank you for, for taking the time to talk to us, answer the questions. And uh, I think everyone learns about astronaut training. I personally think it's now the coolest job out there. Uh, so a huge, a huge thank you. And, and from the OGL and the HGAC team, thank you very much as well. Thanks a lot, Laura. Thank you. My mission is then uh, accomplished. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm sorry that I that I don't have more time and and next time I will talk publicly. I promise I, I, I will do better. But this is really hard for me tonight. Um, thank you for all the participants again. Volker Roma I was super happy to see you, and I will just exit immediately. Good luck to everyone. And uh, and yeah, go ahead, apply, go for it. The only risk that you take is to have me as a teacher. So that's the only <laughs> difficult part. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Bye, guys. Au revoir. Bye. Au revoir. It was great seeing you, Laura. I think there's even more people applying now that they know that they might have Laura as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we can move on to the Q&A session or um, Volker, yeah, was there other, other things that you wanted to, to tell us about maybe before we move to the Q&A? No, I think that was anyhow when I wanted to, to end and in the meantime, I answered two or three questions in the chat. Great, but thank you. I'm, I'm here for any more questions. Okay, so moving on to uh, the first uh, questions that we that we received, maybe let's come back to uh, Romain uh, a little bit. Uh, we won't let you fall asleep there, Romain. Uh, so a few people were wondering if you knew uh, how many people initially applied uh, to the Mars 500 selection. So I don't have the exact numbers, but actually there were two selections for Mars 100. There was an early one, I think it was in 2007 or a few years after. And um, those ones went to the Mars 105. Uh, I mean, a few, a couple of ones, one uh, German, one French were selected for the Mars 105. And, and then um, the, the remaining ones were called back for the Mars 520. 
And it looks like they may not have enough candidates to, to have a meaningful um, pool of candidates. And so they, they redid a new selection, which was open for a very short amount of time. And that's the one I saw. And for this one, I think we were just four or 500 people to apply for it. And for the first one, I think it was 5,000, give or take. So still quite quite a significant amount. Uh, a few people also asked us if you uh, knew if there was any women applicants. Uh, I assume there were a few. So on the European side, the call for candidates was open to everybody. And, um, and if I remember correctly, the, the mix, the ratio was 15% of uh, candidates were women and the rest was, uh, was men. So quite similar to astronaut selection so far, actually. Um, yeah. Maybe moving on to uh, Volker. We've had quite a lot of questions for Volker as well. Um, so uh, we've had a lot of specifically medical questions that we won't necessarily all address. We're really sorry, but uh, um, there are, as Volker said, you, you just need to, to apply and then ESA it will do a great job in selecting uh, um, people. But uh, maybe we can address um, your experience, Volker. Uh, you've had quite a significant experience in human spaceflight in the sense that you also worked on Mir in addition to uh, ISS flights. Uh, we were wondering if you had any visions for where human spaceflight might go in the future. Uh, any inputs on uh, the developing interests in private space flights or uh, privatizations of space uh, stations? Uh, what would be your take on that? Uh, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, maybe before answering your, your question, one thing to answer some of the, the questions in the chat. Um, the medical requirements are very, very often not black and white in, in the sense of if you have this, then it's no go. Uh, the, 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 the way it is worded very often is this and this may disqualify, but has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there are only very, very few which are really no-go uh, immediately, but uh, height, asthma, allergies, um, uh, those are things, you know, they're normal uh, variants uh, of a human being, and they are not unhealthy or pathologies. So, um, that's why it always says has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And so don't think too much, just apply and uh, then we figure it out. Yeah, well, um, yes, indeed. I, I, I did not even work uh, ISS, to be honest. Uh, I was a pure shuttle person. So I was flight surgeon on shuttle. Um, and then I became the boss and then <laughs> I didn't work missions anymore. Uh, luckily, had some ISU students then joining the team as biomedical engineers and then also physician. Um, so that was great. Um, but yes, um, there was an e evolution. Uh, uh, so when I started late 80s, uh, this was a professional, it was a job. We still had payload specialists, so engine. Um, um, astronauts that only had one flight. Um, they uh, went into space, did science, and then returned back to the university and academ academia. Um, and there was no private initiative, uh, which has now dramatically changed. And I think the big part came in the, uh, when the Russians uh, sold seats on Soyuz. Um, then we had uh, paying customers who were able to pay at the beginning the 15 million, now 50 million, for a seat to fly to the ISS. That was a big opening and we didn't feel very happy at that time because we thought, oh my gosh, what is going to happen if then now somebody is getting sick up there and we have to abort the mission. But in hindsight, it was the best that could happen because who is able to pay 15, 50, 30 million? Either you are very old and rich and age is not necessarily related to good health. Or you are very young and rich, but you never had a very healthy lifestyle because you are a pop star or whatever. So those two extremes we were juggling with. Um, and so in order to enable private citizens to go into space, we changed the way we looked into the medicine and changed the selection requirements in a way to do like an engineer, more a risk 
based analysis. So what are the risks for uh, if that person at that age has this medical risk factor, what can we, what do we need to do for further diagnose? And what do we need to do in terms of intervention to enable this person to fly? And most of, and if you, you can Google uh, some of those early uh, commercial astronauts, they're very open with their medical history and even discussed it in open media. And, uh, uh, and we had some very severe surgery that was done on certain individuals, but then they were able to fly. And this also changed the way we do astronaut selection and astronaut care. We are not looking that much into this black and white, but what is enabling somebody to fly into space? What is our risk analysis? What can we do that we have a good gut feeling that, yeah, this person can fly? And of course, now uh, uh, everything changes with more and more private entities uh, joining. And uh, luckily, some of them uh, learned from us and took uh, at least the, the medical requirements as we have formulated them and modified them. Because as a private entity, you may set your risk level in a different domain. As long as you are dealing with taxpayers' money for space flight, that's a completely different analysis than somebody uh, running their own spacecraft. Uh, they may be a little bit more risk, may, may take a little bit more risk. So I think it's great that uh, commercial entities uh, come in. I think that's the way uh, what we have seen in aviation uh, in the last century, in the 2030s and 40s. And I think that's what we are now seeing uh, with space flight as well. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks a million, Roger. Um, I'll jump. I'll jump back to Roman. Uh, Roman, another question for you. There was a, a lot of questions coming in about Mars 500. Um, uh, so one one question of a bit of a, a general one. What, what was the hardest part of your stay? Did you find in, in the entire duration? So um, during that year and a half, I had ups and downs, and and one of the most difficult. A period. It was more a period than just one day. It was August, September 2011. So one year and two months into the the mission, and and I think there was there were three factors that uh, came into play at the same time. The first one was the, the work. We were doing experiments, and the scientists wanted to see an evolution. So we had to do again and again the same experiments with the same protocol with the same subjects and after some time it's hard to find interest uh, an interest in those experiments we still wanted to do it well for for the results that they would bring but you know it was heavy a bit heavy on the shoulders the second one was food uh, the first part of the mission food was an experiment so we didn't have any freedom for the second part of the mission the food was advised but we could eat whatever we want and it was like it was great at the beginning but then because we didn't want to jeopardize the stocks uh, we would follow the menu that was advised but this menu was a weekly one so every monday the same thing every tuesday the same thing and uh, we had some variety in the stock so for example i think it was on wednesdays uh, we could we had as a, a main uh, protein uh, was uh, fish and it was tuna and in our stocks we had uh, Tuna with um, um, sunflower oil and tuna with just you know, salted water. And everybody loved the one with sunflower oil. It was so much better. So after two months, no more tuna with sunflower oil. And, and yeah, then you lose some variety. So even though it's still good, it's not the same. So little by little, the food was becoming a bit more boring. Still good, but more boring. And the third factor, um, was communication. We were um, simulating the delays of communications with the outside, so we didn't have the internet and, and we couldn't uh, use, uh, we didn't have the radio or TV, um, but we could send messages to the ground control and they would then extract it from the server and send it on the internet to family and friends. Um, and in August, family and friends, they're on holidays, so they don't necessarily have a computer. And in uh, September, they are back to work, back to university, so um, they are quite busy, and I understand. It's just that the fact is, in this period, I had three times less messages than during the rest of the mission. And so those three factors added, um, add, well, added one on top of the other made this period for me harder. I just didn't 
have the, the energy to do all the, the personal activities that I had planned for myself. I just didn't feel like it that much. Um, but um, luckily, as a team, the other helped me out in the evening when I was usually writing messages or reading those messages. Um, I realized it like months later, but they invited me to play some video games all together, like um, um, a LAN video game. And, and we would just spend half an hour, one hour in the evening playing together and then going to each other saying, oh yeah, you saw how I did that. And, and that cheered me up little by little and I could go through this period. So yeah, that would be an example of a period which was a bit tougher. What was the, what was the video game? <laughs> it was Counter Strike. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Love it. Um, when, uh, people might be interested, actually. And is it true? Is there is are NASA looking for new participants for the Mars an, an upcoming Mars five hundred or similar? Or have you heard anything about this? So there is a new study called Sirius, and um, and there are there were already two studies that were launched. So it's organized by the uh, IBMP, the Institute of Biomedical Problems in in Russia. NASA is uh, participating in those ones, and some other agencies are participating. So the the next one was supposed to happen last year, but uh, there is a little thing that's called COVID that happened. So it's still in the process. It should happen as soon as possible. Um, I know that some other agencies, I think um, there were talks for CNES to be participating directly, but I don't know where it is right now. But yes, in the same modules, they are testing um, some new scenarios. So this time it's a lunar base that they're testing. Uh, the, the crews are different. Uh, this time, at least during the last serious study, it was a, a mixed crew, not, uh, not like the Mars 301. Um, so it's still happening. There are still a lot of confinement studies happening around the world. Okay, perfect. And, and to ask you one question, maybe not Mars 500 related, but more from your, your time as a crew support. Um, so, so one of the questions coming in, uh, are hobbies and personal interests important factors in the selection? Uh, so may, maybe not, but maybe you can, maybe you can answer from, from your knowledge with working with astronauts. What, what are common hobbies and activities that, that astronauts do? do they say? Um, hard to answer. Everybody's so different. Um, they, several of them like to play the music. Um, um, some of them like, um, I mean, the usual thing that we uh, uh, think when thinking about astronauts, like piloting, uh, some like to um, scuba dive, hiking, um, uh, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I think those hobbies are important in some ways. Uh, my personal um, hypothesis is that uh, some specific hobbies would bring you some bonus points on your application. Um, because like piloting or scuba diving or skydiving, the, there is an element of risk and you need to, to follow a strict procedure so that you can do it safely. And it shows that, um, you know, those are important skills um, when you are on the space station, not to put yourself and the others uh, in danger by not following the procedures. So I think there are some hobbies that can help. And I think there are some other ones. Um, I was talking about music, but it could be some, some I don't know, some strange liking for, for, for the, the, the French cinemas from the 30s. Um, I don't know, maybe those ones will create a bond during an interview that could um, you know, make you shine in some way. So I guess it's, it's definitely good to have hobbies, like in general, and, uh, and some of them may help. We've heard as well about a lot of uh, hobbies that were then used in space. So for photography or drawing, painting, that are things that are actually being uh, studied uh, also on the ISS. Uh, how is it to dance on the ISS? How do you best for, take pictures from the cupola? Uh, things like that, that sometimes we forget about, but um, a lot of uh, astronauts have done during their flights on the ISS. Um, maybe we can also ask uh, Volker, do you have uh, any um, recommendations on uh, other job or uh, crew support positions that uh, our audience could find particularly interesting or exciting or should keep an eye out on the ESA careers website for? Yeah, there are many, many 
interesting jobs, um, but uh, of, it's still a small community. Um, around the globe, um, I think we were a total of maybe 50 flight surgeons. So we knew each other personally, etc. Uh, biomedical engineers, you have uh, maybe five, six times uh, that many. Uh, but still, it's a small community and job openings are not necessarily, as Laura pointed out, uh, available, uh, available everywhere. Um, and usually they are not um, directly at ESA. Many people want to have a job at ESA, but uh, you have to uh, consider that at, at least at my time at ESA, we were roughly 110 people um, at the European Astronaut Center. And we had, including the astronaut, astronaut 16 ESA staff. All the rest are uh, um, uh, employees of other companies, like MIDES, like DLR, uh, Lufthansa, um, flight training, um, Wiley for, for medicine, etc. So not only look at the uh, website of ESA, but to look into the, the usual suspects uh, that deal with uh, space flight, uh, Boeing, um, uh, um, yeah, Wiley, in, in, in medicine. Um, you also can look into um, networks uh, that are related to um, space activities like ISU, for example, uh, with a huge uh, uh, alumni group, uh, King's College, Imperial College, just to name a few in Europe, um, because that's always the problem. Uh, if you're not a European citizen, forget about any jobs um, and, and astronaut uh, selection, etc. So you need to have a passport uh, in one of the European ESA countries, not the European Union. So, um, but do not only focus on ESA. Thanks a lot, Volker. Uh, so we are conscious of time and uh, we'd like to ask you maybe one last question to, to both of you. Uh, what would be your last tip or word of encouragement for uh, anyone in the audience who's interested in applying for the selection or for a position uh, in the area of human spaceflight in general. Um, Romain, do you want to tell us a few words about that? So back to, to Mars 100, when I applied in my head, there was no way I would be taken. I had no connection with space. So already here, all of you, you start with a much higher level than I was at that time and, and it worked. So there is um, this first step, apply and each step, just give it your all. Um, try to be as as honest and as whole as possible, uh, because that's the best way to to move forward and take it as um, um, each step as a victory. You, I was so happy to be at each step of the selection. I was not saying I want to be at the next one. Of course, I I thought like I want to be there, but I'm I'm just here. Be present when you have those tests so that you, as, as Volker said, like read all the questions. When you are present, you can answer more efficiently. Um, and um, yeah, good luck. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Actually, I'd like to, to remind our audience of something that Samantha Cristoforetti said during uh, her, her conference, press conference about the this year's selection. She said, it's a very safe place to fail. And I find that particularly pertinent to the situation. Uh, just go ahead, apply and, and take things day to day as they go. Be happy for, for every stage that you get to. Volker, would you like to give us any tips, any encouragements for the audience? I can echo what Romain said and um, be authentic. Don't get into the trap that you assume how you would have to present yourself to get the job. Be yourself, that's important because uh, we have high paid psychologists and they will very quickly identify or sooner than later that you're not authentic, that something is wrong with your personality. So, um, and yeah, um, take it easy. The chances are very, very small, but um, it's a one time or maybe twice in your lifetime that you have the chance to apply. Just do it and be yourself. Um, that, that is, I, I believe the, the most important thing. I think, I, I think I think that's a brilliant way to uh, to finish up. And um, so very quickly, I'll, I'll I'll share one or two last slides we have here. 
Um, so yeah, I think I think we're just pretty much taking this opportunity to say a huge thank you uh, to to our speakers, to both our speakers here, Roman and Charles, and Volker Deman. Uh, a massive thank you. Uh, I, I think the information you've shared has been invaluable, and and you couldn't get it anywhere else. Uh, but also a huge thank you to our audience as well today. So I think we nearly nearly had two hundred people at one point. So all these questions that you sent in and have got answered, uh, we, we wouldn't have been able to come up with these questions on our own. So so thank you for for all where you came from. Uh, quick, a quick plug, um, if you may, as we go back here, sorry. Um, yes, so the next webinar we have in this webinar series is episode three. So it's candidate profiles, one of them to be the next generation of ESA astronauts. So we're going to have a couple of people who will be applying uh, to just get an idea and put some faces to the name of who, who are these people who are applying to the next, uh, next astronaut select. So be sure to join that It's part of the series. So it's on April the 29th at 6 p.m. CET. Uh, this will be confirmed, but, but keep an eye on all the SGAC social media and the Our Giant Leap page uh, as, as, uh, to get the latest updates. Um, Charlotte, I, I, if there's anything else to add, I'll leave the last word with you. Uh, just one last thing. If you want to learn more about space in general, if you want to learn more about the astronaut career in general, please join the Our Giant Leap Slack. Um, if you are just a space enthusiast looking for a network and for great friends to share projects with, please join the Space Generation Advisory Council. It's really a great place. Uh, you can really find anything you're interested in with regards to the space sector. So we highly encourage you to have a look, join, find a group of people with who you can talk about your passion and just learn new things. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining. Uh, please be in touch for the next episodes. And uh, once again, thank you to uh, Romain Charles, to Volker Daman, but also to Laura André Boyer. Uh, if you want to uh, keep in touch with Owen, myself, the Argent Leap team, our speakers, please uh, have a look at uh, the Argent Leap at spacegeneration.org uh, email address. And uh, feel free to just drop us some questions or some emails. Have a nice evening, day, afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and uh, hopefully see you next time. Thank you, Charlotte and Owen, for organizing the whole thing. It was fun. <laughs> so it was okay. great. Thank you, and good Thanks, night. Thanks, But Bye. now I have to bring my grandchild in, in bed, so she's always <laughs> knocking on Reality the door Reality comes back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see Thanks you guys. again, guys. See you then. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. And thank you so much for the great audience. So cool to see so many people attending. Thanks, Owen. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. It's great to see the chat. Thank you. Good night. Good evening.